Hi, I'm Sean McVeigh, Director of Adult Faith Formation for St. Joseph Catholic Church in Marion, Iowa. I want to welcome you to this video, which is a continuation on the topic of morality. In a special way, we're going to address love and sexuality in this particular video. I grew up in the United States of America, and in our culture, the word love often seems to be associated with a feeling of affection for a family member or for a romantic relationship. But love really encompasses a little bit more than that, or even a lot more than that, depending on how you're looking at it. In the Greek language, there's actually four separate words used to identify four different types of love. So agape would be considered unconditional love. This is the love of Jesus on the cross. So if we look at a crucifix and we think about the prayer that Jesus made in the garden before his suffering and death, well, he was actually already suffering in the garden, emotionally, spiritually, to the point where he was sweating like drops of blood. And he prayed, Father, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. And he accepted this gruesome death being nailed to a tree, being nailed, nailed to this wood after being whipped and scourged and crowned with thorns. He accepted all that because it would be through that that we could be saved. So we didn't deserve it. There's nothing we did or could do to earn our salvation. It was a free gift of love. He gave himself to the point of suffering and death, which goes against our human senses. We, we kind of tend toward, seek, toward seeking pleasurable uh, things. And so what this shows us is that the most powerful form of love is a choice to do what's in the other person's best interest, to give yourself so that others can benefit. Now, when you hear the word love, is that what you always associate it with? I'll let you ponder that, but in the meantime, let's take a look at the next form of love that we see when we look at, at this topic in the Greek language. So storge would be an empathy or an affection, much like a parent toward a child. So this is a, a very family-oriented type of love. There's also filial love, which is, you know, kind of involves friends and, or brotherly type of love. Again, it's relationship-oriented, and there is a feeling that's often involved with these types of love. Then, of course, we have the eros, which is sort of romantic feelings. It's, if we think about these four different types of love, the last three that I mentioned, storge, philia, and eros, they do involve feelings, different types of feelings. But the first one, agape, really involves an act of the will. It's a choice. It's really important for us to keep this in mind, especially since the highest form of love really is the form of choice, the agape. So when we think of love, we need to keep all these types of details in mind. It's especially important because our culture seems to put eros as the highest form of love, which is a feeling that can come and go, a romantic feeling. And if we think of that in the context of a loving relationship, like a marriage relationship, those feelings change as the love matures. So if we were holding on to eros, you know, as this romantic type of strong feeling, yet that is changing the dynamic of a loving relationship, and then later on we could feel Eros towards someone else other than our spouse. If we only followed Eros as the highest form of love and just chased after it, you know, that is how we can really disrupt our lives and fall into sin, as I'm going to articulate throughout this video. And that's another important reason why we need to look at this topic, is so that we know how to make choices, make an act of the will to follow Jesus, and the proper format for our lives. I'm going to refer to St. John Paul II's Theology of the Body as part of the introduction of this whole topic because we're going to start off with, you know, in this topic of love, we've been looking at relationships a little bit, and this arrows type is really an important one to look at because it's very focused on in our culture today. So it's important for us to recognize what was God's intention with this type of love? It was really to bring two people together 
to form a loving relationship. And when we look at the theology of the body that was presented by St. John Paul II, we see that God created us so that we could make a gift of ourselves. That's actually God's intention in the way he made us. So when he created Adam, he said, it's not good for man to be alone. And God created Eve, and the two were to be a gift to one another. They were to make a gift of themselves. Adam was to give himself completely to Eve. She was to receive the gift of his love and return it to him in the form of life. There is freedom in living totally for the other and that person living totally for you. I'm going to elaborate on this a little bit more later in this presentation, but let's look at the, the fact that Eve was tempted to take the forbidden fruit. She was tempted to take for herself what it was to be like God. We see that in Genesis 3. This is what we call the original sin, and it caused a rupture in the unity of the body and soul. When God created us, it was not his intention for us to have to die before going to heaven. That was a consequence of sin. Because of the corruption that came to our human body and our existence because of sin, we could no longer go straight from this life to heaven because nothing imperfect can enter heaven. So God had to allow this rupture to take place so that he could, through his grace, purify us and get us to heaven. So at the end of our earthly life, we die and our soul is ripped or separated from the body. And we stand before judgment before God. And if we ultimately will get to go to heaven, our soul goes there. But at the end of the world, Jesus will come again to judge and our bodies will be resurrected from the grave and our soul and body reunited. God will glorify our body and those who were deemed worthy of heaven will share eternal life with God, body and soul. That is going to be amazing. Now, those who, who have rejected God and are damned, they will have a body-soul reunion, but they will spend all eternity in the sufferings of hell. And I hope that we are aspiring to heaven and not just taking the, the road that leads to hell. With all this in mind, Jesus restores us through the work of redemption. But sometimes this is not fully recognized until after this life, as I kind of alluded to there. And that's actually where the concept of purgatory becomes really important and clear. We must be perfected in love in order to enter heaven. So, you know, if we die with imperfections, God allows us to be purified and made holy, perfect in purgatory, basically perfects us in love so that we can endure the existence or the presence of love for all eternity. Because when you're in a state of imperfection and you are in the presence of perfect love, it's too much to handle. And so you need to be brought up to that level of perfected love in order to be able to really embrace all of what love has to give. Let's just continue a little bit on this theme, like with Adam and Eve being the first husband and wife. The bond between husband and wife is both conjugal and procreative. So God made Adam and Eve to become one, to be together, and the fruit of that oneness is to bring forth life. Now, the interesting mystery is that God made us in his image and likeness, so we were born, or God created us in that way. Adam and Eve were created in God's image and likeness, and Satan tempted Eve to think that she needed to do something to become like God. We were already made in his image and likeness. And if we look at the family, Adam was to be a gift to Eve. He was to give himself totally, just not just emotionally, but physically, give himself to Eve. She was to receive that love, the totality of that love. And the fruit of that love is new life. She would have a child that she would then return in love to Adam and the two together would pour out their love on the child. So there's this, this cycle of love that brings forth life that begets more love in a sense in the relationship. 
So love expands from just a gift of self to you, but a gift of self to both. So this is the, the nuptial meaning of the body that St. John Paul II was really trying to bring out. This was God's meaning for love and relationships between a husband and wife. So in order for us to continue to live the way God intended, unification and procreation are totally integrated aspects of this kind of love that need to be there. So unitive faithful love involves the full personhood of the spouses, a love that encompasses the mind, hearts, emotions, bodies, souls, and aspirations. They are no longer two but one, as I mentioned. And I also mentioned that like the agape type of love really does become the most important because, uh, because of the fall, we are disordered in our members. And sometimes we have to rely on making the choice to make a gift of ourselves. We have to choose to do the right and the good because sometimes our feelings or, or emotions or desires might be all over the place. We might be getting tempted into sin. Our feelings and emotions and, and everything might be trying to draw us in a direction, but the love of the cross is, no, I have a commitment. I'm going to stick and be true to my commitment and not follow all these things that are tempting me to go against God's plan. Now, another aspect of this type of love is it's procreative in that God calls the married couple to be open to children. Remembering always that having a child is not a right, but rather a gift from God. They share the creative power and fatherhood of God. Families are the image of the Trinity, as I talked about. So we really need to be open to love in a marriage type relationship in order to be truly loving. And if we're not open to love, it draws into question our intentions. What are our intentions in this relationship? Is it to make a gift of myself or am I entering into this relationship to take? And we see the difference between love, give, take, sin. Now, in order to help us, once sin had entered the world, God helps us by giving us clear commandments to follow. Because as I already mentioned, our feelings, desires, there's temptations, all these things can try to pull us astray from God's will, God's plan. So God gave us the commandment, you shall not commit adultery. How does this commandment direct our lives? How does concupiscence factor into situations where this commandment might need to be practiced? What does the world often say when a married person feels stronger attraction towards someone other than his or her spouse? These questions you should hopefully already have answers to because I've been alluding to them in this presentation already. So how does this commandment, you shall not commit adultery, factor into this situation? I'm married. I've been married for almost 14 years now. And as a human person, sure, I could feel attracted to somebody along the way. But because of my commitment to faithful love, I, I know that is simply a temptation and I don't even want to entertain it because the more you entertain a temptation, the harder it gets to deal with. And you might be able to relate to that. I know that. So it's like, nope, uh, no thank you. And I can continue on freely in my life. So the commandment safeguards me from falling into sin. So again, that concept of concupiscence, which I mentioned in the last video when addressing the topic of morality, how does that fit into here? Well, we are broken because of the original sin. Our feelings and emotions and desires sometimes do not lead us in the path of God's will. They are disordered. And so having the commandment helps us know how to make our choices in order to stay on the path that leads to God and to love. Feelings come and go, but our ability to choose to love always remains. We can always choose to lay down our lives, to give of ourselves in sacrifice. So if I'm tempted in this direction, it may feel like a sacrifice to remain faithful and make the choice to lay down my life in love. That's what this is communicating to us. That's what the cross tells us. And this is important because the world we live in, as I already mentioned, 
encourages people to follow eros, that, that emotional, romantic love. It's a fleeting feeling, in a sense. So if I feel attracted to somebody, or even strongly attracted, maybe even a stronger attraction than to my own spouse, I know that I've already committed myself to my vocation in life, and my vocation involves faithful love. And so I just dismiss the temptation. But the world says, do whatever makes you feel good. Do whatever makes you happy. If you're not happy in this relationship, then you should get out of it. That's what the world says. And they equate happiness with a good feeling, but those feelings are fleeting. That is not happiness. Tightly tied into this is living chastity. So what is chastity? And how is it lived out according to one's state in life? Because it's going to be different depending on your state in life. For someone like a priest or religious, chastity equals celibacy, which means you do not engage in any type of physical sexual activity. For an unmarried person, chastity also equates to celibacy. You do not engage in any type of physical sexual activity. For a married person, chastity will involve even periodic times of celibacy. I mean, if you're in a stage in your relationship where you've determined that it's not best to have a child at that time, I'm gonna talk a little bit more of this in a minute, uh, but if, if for some reason you're trying to space out the birth of your children, then you would practice what's called natural family planning, which I, again, I'm gonna elaborate on in a moment, but that involves periods of celibacy, which means you're not engaging in physical activity, even in the marriage relationship. So chastity is living your sexuality according to your state in life. All people, married, single, religious, and ordained, need to acquire the virtue of chastity. Chastity means the successful integration of sexuality within the person and thus the inner unity of man in his body and spiritual being. Chastity includes an apprenticeship in self-mastery, which is a training in human freedom. Self-mastery is a long and exacting work. One can never consider it acquired once and for all. It presupposes renewed effort at all stages of life. So chastity, living it out, is an incorporation of all of our feelings and thoughts into living righteously. So as I was kind of picturing for you or depicting for you, you know, if I had an attraction, I can just say, nope, I'm not going there. And that is the living out of the virtue, this discipline of remaining faithful in love to my commitments and not just following my feelings. So this message is not the message of our world. And it's our world that tries to lead us into the path of sin Whereas God wants us to live a holy life that leads to him. And at times that means carrying our cross, which means we're not following our emotions or feelings. We're, we're following the path that is a challenge to choose, which is the path of faithfulness in the context of a married relationship. Let's look a little closer at sins against chastity. Lust would be an example. It is a disordered desire for or an inordinate enjoyment of sexual pleasure. Masturbation, another one, which is a sinful misuse of sexuality in an inherently selfish act, devoid of love. Fornication, which is sexual intercourse between unmarried persons. And it is sinful because it violates the dignity of persons and the nuptial meaning and purpose of sexuality, which is ordered only to the unitive and procreative goals of married people. Incest would be another example, which is sexual relations between close relatives, in, is, and it's always wrong. S sexual abuse of any type would be wrong because it harms the individuals abused. Pornography is wrong, prostitution is wrong, rape is wrong, homosexual acts are wrong. These are all intrinsically disordered and immoral. And especially in our culture right now, you know, there's a, a, a movement of people who call themselves gay or homosexual or lesbian to be accepted as equal and for 
homosexual marriages to be recognized. And this is actually, it's disordered. What we're called to do, what we as a church are called to do is to love them and to tell them we're here to support you, but we do not accept homosexual unions. They are invalid. They are not God's plan. And we see that clearly because part of God's intention for married relationships is to the, for them to be naturally procreative. Like the, in the context of the relationship, procreation should be a natural occurring component. In homosexual relationships, it's not naturally possible for the two to procreate, which is what discloses the disordered component of those relationships. Let's talk about it for a moment, though. A person could have an emotional attraction towards someone else of the same sex. In our culture, they say, well, that means you should be able to act on it and, and physically, sexually express that. But that's not actually love. So love, remember, is the gift of self in the form of sacrifice. In a married relationship, you know, if, if the couple, for good reason, is trying to postpone the conception of another child right now, they may need to practice the discipline of celibacy. And so the, the way that they're loving each other and helping their family situation or loving their children that they have is by abstaining, which is a sacrifice. It would be much easier to not have to make that sacrifice. But no, they're making a gift of themselves by sacrificing out of love for each other. So in the physical homosexual relationship, it's a gratification. You might have attraction for that person, but this is not a sacrifice. You're not laying down your life in the form of sacrifice for that person, but rather you are indulging in physical pleasure with each other. And I know that could be hard for someone to hear if they're of that orientation, but what I'm saying is the church calls us to be a support. We're like, we care about you. We want to be a support for you. But we want you to know that it's not okay to engage in those physical activities. It's not God's plan. Just like anyone who's not married is called to celibacy. So we're not, ex we're not just singling out people who feel homosexually oriented. It's all people who are not in a marriage relationship are called to live celibacy. And our culture has been sort of blinded from that because that... That's not the message you receive from a lot of the media and, and uh, everything like that that's out there. So that is a very sensitive topic. And um, I just encourage us all to be caring, empathetic toward the challenges that they face. But we also have to lovingly let them know that it's not okay to engage in those activities. You're not going to find love and freedom by pursuing that channel. Love and freedom is in self-mastery, as I'm going to talk about in just a moment. And it's in making a gift of yourself in the form of sacrifice, not in gratification. This does not feel good. And that is the highest form of love that Jesus showed us. Now, related to this topic, I want to just touch on artificial contraception. And then I want to elaborate on this idea that I've been touching on with natural family planning. So what does artificial contraception do and how does that impact our ability to love? And what does it mean to sacrifice for the betterment of others? So artificial contraception would be you're using some form of an artificial means to prevent conception of children, which means you're not open to bringing forth life. Now, what was the flow of love in a marriage relationship? How do we image the Trinity? The husband pours his love out onto the, life, the wife. She receives that love totally and brings forth new life in the form of a child and gives that back to the husband. And the two of them have a powerful cycle of love that flows out even into new life. Now to cut that off, to separate that flow of love is to cut off even the creative hand of God in the relationship. In a sense, we are removing God from the most intimate love relationship he created us for and which he intended to be the center of. So artificial contraception 
in, in the words of Pope Paul VI, he affirmed the church's teaching that artificial contraception is gravely immoral because it contravenes God's will for the conjugal act. And that conjugal act unites the spouses in their love and must also be open to the creation of new life. If you're not open to life, that means you're not fully open to love. It means you're not fully open to God and His presence in your relationship. Now, I've mentioned natural family planning. What is that and how is that different? So, if you look on the United States Catholic College of Bishops website, it says that natural family planning is the general title for the scientific, natural, and moral methods of family planning that can help married couples either achieve or postpone pregnancy. Natural family planning methods are based on the observation of the naturally occurring signs and symptoms of the fertile and infertile phases of a woman's menstrual cycle. No drugs, devices, or surgical procedures are used to avoid pregnancy. Since the methods of natural family planning respect the loving, giving, unitive, and life-giving, procreative nature of the conjugal act, they support God's design for married love, for married couples. So as I've said, okay, my wife and I, we have four children, and let's say um, my wife has health issues and for those reasons we discern that it would be best or wisest for her to have time to recover from the health issues before we try to have our next child and so we are going to try to postpone that until medical issues are resolved now in order to do that in the context of what the way we've been talking is we would abstain from sexual activity during the times of the, her menstrual cycle where she would be fertile. Now, we're still open to life. We still actively say, Lord, first of all, we pray for healing in this situation, but at the same time, we want to remain open to you and your will. So it would still be possible for her to conceive in the context of the approach that we would be using in this situation, which we're calling natural family planning. So we are making a sacrifice for each other so me as the man would be making a sacrifice for her to try to help her recover from her physical in infirmities so that she could have another child. And she's also making a sacrifice so that she can hopefully get better so that we can have, bring more life into the world. So there's a mutual sacrifice. We're not seeking any form of physical gratification. In fact, we are postponing or putting all that off, perhaps even indefinitely, depending on how challenging this life situation could become for her, like her infirmity. So we're open to God's will. We're making a gift of self by making a sacrifice for one another. And hopefully you can see clearly the difference between like natural family planning, where you're open to life, but making a sacrifice of yourself. You're making a gift of yourself in love by having practicing discipline whereas artificial contraception you still engage in acts that are gratifying and you just totally close out God's ability to be present in the conception of a child. I think that topic is fairly clear to most people in in this day and age. So let's talk a little bit about conception. So obviously there's a natural means where a couple can conceive a child but Natural family planning is also used to help couples conceive, like they're, they're able to hone in on the time periods where the woman is most fertile or able to conceive, and so they would focus on that time period to make their efforts to conceive. But at the same time, there are immoral ways that couples can try to conceive a child. And we need to be empathetic to these couples because People who love each other and desperately want to bring life into the world and have children and who are not able to do that at this time, it is a very difficult and heartfelt pain for them. So that's where we need to be empathetic. But we also need to encourage them by saying, look, there are methods that are not moral for you to approach in trying to conceive. 
So an example would be efforts to achieve pregnancy outside of the act of sexual intercourse, like in vitro fertilization, are morally wrong for the same reason. They separate conception from sexual intercourse. And there are types of like in vitro fertilization where if they fertilize multiple eggs and some are left in a dish or something and not implanted, I mean, there's just all kinds of wrong there. So when, when conception takes place, that person receives a soul. It is a full person and so must be treated with the utmost dignity. So ultimately what I'm saying is there are very um, clear immoral ways of trying to conceive and if you ever find yourself or someone you know in a situation where you're looking for ways to help you conceive, there are um, approaches out there that I would encourage you to look into. For the context of this video, though, it's not a video on how to conceive or not conceive, but what the church's teachings are in relation to that. So I want to keep moving on in this topic. And I want to kind of conclude by looking at what some threats are to marriage in our world these days. So adultery would be a, a very clear threat to marriage. It's a grave sin that violates the covenant relationship of marriage that the two have bound themselves to in God's plan. So when you get married, you make vows before God till death do you part to maintain that faithful love. And as I've laid out clearly in this video, it's possible for either or even both of those spouses to feel attractions, even stronger attractions to someone else other than their spouse. However, they've bound themselves in a covenant relationship before God. And so it's time to make the sacrificial love of laying down your life to to choose to be faithful and to commit yourself to this relationship despite your feelings. And that is a sacrifice. It is a gift of love. The choice to remain faithful is a gift of love. And in fact, one of the highest forms of it. Another threat to marriage is divorce. This breaks the promise made by the couple to remain married until death. The divorce rate has gone very high in our world these days. And to many, it may seem commonplace. Some people may even enter marriage thinking, oh, if it doesn't work out, I'll just get a divorce. And I've heard people say that. But that is exactly what we're talking about here. This is a threat to marriage because that is not how you are supposed to approach this covenant relationship until death do you part. You don't go into it thinking if it doesn't work out, you know, I'll just get a divorce. You go into it thinking, I'm going to commit myself to this, to my human death on earth. I will stay true to my choice for the rest of my earthly life. Another serious threat to marriage is cohabitation. An unmarried couple living together involves the serious sin of fornication. It does not conform to God's plan for marriage and is always wrong and objectively sinful. Now, our culture has made it socially acceptable in the context of our culture for couples to live together before marriage, but that is not morally acceptable. It doesn't lead to our happiness and freedom. It is actually, it's like putting the cart before the horse, that old saying. You're putting things out of order. And when you're putting things out of order, it leads to disorder and it leads to things breaking down, which is another component of why the divorce rate is so high in our world these days. I have known many friends and couples in my life who have lived together even for many years and then got married and almost immediately after marriage, they get a divorce. What's going on here? Well, there is an evil entity often referred to as Satan or the devil. And he's at work trying to really ruin our lives. So for the couple who's living in sin, he's just, he's happy. He's like, oh, well, I already got them. And then when they, let's say that couple's living in sin, they're living together, living in a fornicating relationship, then they get married. Well, then he just now, now the next step is to break that up and cause more damage because now they're breaking their covenant relationship. That's if they were even validly married. There's people who don't even engage in valid marriages anymore, which is a whole nother topic. 
But getting back to the starting point on this is that living together, cohabitation, is a terrible thing. And if you know anybody living in that situation, we need to be loving toward them. We need to be patient and kind, but we also need to let them know that this is not actually good. This is, this, you're setting yourself up for something bad here. And you're living in a way that is actually sinful. It's actually pulling you away from the love that God intends for you, from God's love for you. Another threat to marriage would be polygamy. Having more than one spouse at a time violates the understanding of the equal dignity that a man and woman bring to marriage. And it contradicts the unitive purpose of marriage. So when we think of this whole topic, some key words that really need to be remembered is faithfulness, is self-sacrifice, discipline. All of these are related to the type of love that we are called to give. If you're not married or if you're a religious or priest, you're called to live celibately. And in doing so, you are making a full gift of yourself to all people, to everyone you interact with. And the married couple, are, they are called to make a full gift of themselves to each other. And at times, that could mean they have to remain celibate or refrain from sexual activity in order to fulfill the needs of the spouse and the family, depending on the circumstances. And I will just recall for all of us that this self-mastery involved in incorporating our sexuality into living chastely at times or indefinitely, it's, this self-mastery is an ongoing process throughout our lives, and it's not something that's going to be easy. It's something we're going to have to really devote ourselves to. And that's why it's so important for us to be educated on this topic, because the world is giving us a different message of saying, follow the feelings, follow the concupiscence, follow the sin, is really what the world is, is often telling us. But we, want, we don't want to do that. We want to take the path that leads to righteousness. We want to take the path that leads to the ultimate act of love, which is the gift of self, which leads to salvation with God, happiness for all eternity. That's our end goal. So thank you so much for tuning into this video. I hope that it has brought some insight for some people, encouraged others, and given us all something to think about. But let's continue to aspire to live that holy life for the Lord and imitation of the Lord. Until next time, take care and God bless.